Hello and welcome to Novosibirsk, a roaring megalopolis among the endless steppe of West Siberia. In the previous episode, we've taken a look at its metro and tram systems, and today I propose to continue our exploration of the rail transport and also see a little bit of trolley buses. Let's go! Trans-Siberian Railway is the longest railway in the world. It begins in Moscow and connects Europe and Asia, reaching the shore of Pacific Ocean. Novosibirsk owes its very existence to this railway, as it was founded to be a settlement of workers who were building a railway bridge across the Op River. Freight station and river port have followed, turning it into a good town, but a real game changer happened when it was decided to branch Trans-Siberian Railway to the south, and the mayor persuaded the site to do this in Novosibirsk. Being at the intersection of major traffic flows has quickly made it grow into a large commercial and industrial center we know today. One of the spans of that fateful bridge is still standing as a monument in the city beginning park, reminding us how much do we owe to the railway. Trans-Siberian passes through the region from the west to the east. As indeed along its entire length of 9000 km, it is a double track and electrified. The area around the railway is pretty ordinary plain with occasional light forest, and my favorite spot is the valley of River Chik, which with its places is unusually winding and wayward. Here you can see the original two-track embankment that was constructed in the end of the 19th century, and a new and higher third-track embankment that provides less steep slopes and is used exclusively for westbound freight trains. This landscape gives us a good picture of how the freight flows are directed on this railway. Almost all heavy traffic goes east to west. Thousands of loaded container tank and hopper cars are running day and night, transporting the rich natural resources of Siberia to its first world consumers. And the returning trains are much lighter, so they can go over the old embankment and have a deeper dive into the valley without putting themselves to the danger of not being able to climb the steep slope later. Besides that, around 20 long distance passenger trains pass through in each direction. Long distance here means that the vast majority of trains are originating in Moscow or other European cities 2000 km to the west. They will continue the journey for at least a thousand more. For trips that long, trains consist almost exclusively from sleeping cars, from about 30 to 50 beds in each. Often a mail car is also attached to the passenger train. Local aviation is not well developed here, and the only affordable flights are the ones to the country's capital. So while today almost nobody uses these trains to travel to European part of Russia, they can be a reasonable way to make a trip between different cities and towns of Siberia. Commuter trains are guests on these lines. The shire tracks with the freight trains have to be squeezed into a tight schedule. There are only a few surrounding towns, the rural area is not very populated too, so we only have like 11 or 12 couples of trains per day. For provincial Russia it's actually a great service amount, most regions can only afford 4 or 5, so once more high 5 Novosibirsk. All the trains originate in the central railway station, and there are three directions to go, eastbound, westbound and southbound. They are officially named like that. Southbound direction has two branches one of which also offers an extra route that has a romantic name through in sky to Sokhov, that reminds us to make our way through hardships to the stars. From a technical point of view, there already is everything needed to run a through train service like REI in Paris or S-Bahn in German cities, and in the golden year of 2003 it was actually performed. They even built two new convenient railway platforms in the city center, but the idea just did not took off. It was naive to think that many people will consider using a train that runs once an hour or two as a way to get around the city, and it's impossible to increase the frequency because of the cargo trains. The freight overpass exists, so you won't see the oil tanks going through the city center, but it does not free up all the tracks needed to run an S-Bahn-like service. Sad to say so, but despite all the power and beauty of Trans-Siberian Railway, the idea of integrating its suburban trains to the city's rapid transit system will not come to life anytime soon. Now let's take a look at the rolling stock. The oldest units in service are these grumpy ED2T units, built in the middle of the 90s, and phlegmatic ET2 units, which to an experience and die look indistinguishable, and that's not far from the truth, as they are both successors of ER2, the only mass-produced Soviet electrical multiple unit, which was fabricated in Latvia and after the collapse of the USSR independently by two competing factories in Russia. A little bit improved ED4M units make up the majority of commuter train fleet and being painted to the same flashy color scheme of the Russian State Railway Company also do not stand out very much. In fact, most of the commuter train users will be surprised to hear that there are three different types of trains in the Novosibirsk area. Interiors of these units are very spacious, each compartment has six seats, making it about 100 seats per coach, or 250 passengers under crash load. 
The strains are more than half a meter wider than average European ones. Of the rush hour you can even lie down here comfortably. Traditionally, these cars have vestibules where large goods can be carried, a dark and scary intercar space, from which you can see the rails and hear the rattle of primitive automatic coupling. This very unit also has a business class car. It was probably used in one of the failed medium distance train projects that were just not meant to be here. Reason for that is that the closest cities are 4 and 600 kilometers away, which means 6 to 8 hours of travel at a speed limited by the presence of the freight trains, and such an offer does not have any benefits compared to cheaper and more flexible buses. One big disadvantage of these trains that you don't often see in modern systems and probably take for granted is that they are very tall, while the platform is located almost at the ground level. In the European part of Russia, they build proper elevated platforms, but go 500 km to the east and you'll have to climb the very steep stairs in order to board to get off the train. Another frustrating thing about the stations is the architecture. It has never been fancy here, but certainly featured the neat style that was special to the West Siberian region of the Trans-Siberian Railway. It is not treated with respect while performing the renovation works and is just covered with the cheapest materials available and in the ugliest way possible. Turn away and just watch the railroad. Even if you come 10 minutes before your train, chances are you'll see at least two freight trains, one in each direction. Another thing to enjoy here are these beautiful metallic power poles that were originally installed when this section was first electrified in 1951. No one can avoid becoming a railway fan of growing up in a place like this. Ticketing system is the same as everywhere else, an awfully stiff machine that gives you pieces of thermal paper. I'm buying one to film the Chick River bridges we've seen before. That's 30 km to the west, and the price is $1.10 for the return. If you are wondering what's that noise, that's level crossing at the western side railway platform. Here Trans-Siberian Railway and a few sidings cross a local secondary road. As you can see here, shunting is performed non-stop, even in the morning rush hour, and the traffic situation here is pretty intense. In the city center, of course, they have tunnels and overpasses, but here in the outskirts of the workers' quarters, people have to deal with this. And after a short break, the bell starts ringing again. Half an hour later, we arrive at the cold and empty railway platform in the middle of nowhere. It does not serve any town or village, and it seems time the only one who let the train hit. Nevertheless, the platform is well lit. A few minutes later, an oncoming train is calling at the station. I see recent deep tracks in the snow. Cars probably pass here sometimes. Very soon I'll have to make a pattern for him. What is this place? Behind a narrow forest belt that was planted along with the construction of the railway to protect the tracks from snow drifts, there are summer residence villages. Almost every family has one of these, and every year from late April to early September, people stuff themselves onto trains to get there. You've seen six car trains, but during the summer season they are extended to ten cars. Most of these residences were built starting from the 1960s by the people themselves, without any professional supervision or safety inspection. Without power tools, with bare hands and from materials that same amusing ways managed to get in the general shortage situation of the Soviet Union. Some of these houses only got electricity in 2000s, and the water is often provided on schedule by architectural dominance of these places. Water towers, made from decommissioned industrial tanks. Land was given away by the state through the enterprises where people were employed, and if some residents community was formed by railway workers, you might often see old cars transformed into houses. One of the primary purposes of having summer residences was growing your own roots and vegetables there, which helped people to survive through food shortages and endless economic disasters. Our grandmothers were pulling giant cuts of seedings by the steep stairs of these trains, 
and pushing them over the dirt roads from supply farms to their land plots. And that did the same with the harvest in the opposite direction. Illegal merchants were cruising back and forth the trains, offering fertilizers and insecticides. The economy got way better than them. Primitive hand farming got out of fashion, and many of these residences were just abandoned. We can now have plenty of fun fooling around among the ancient castles of Sovietness. The story about the transport of Novosibirsk won't be complete without mentioning trolley buses. You can see the overhead wires over almost any big street of the city. The network is very extensive, and unlike the tram, there are routes across the city end to end, as trolley buses are circulating on both bridges. Once there were four tram depots and four trolley bus depots. Now only two tram depots are left, but none of the trolley bus depots were shut down, and every day they send more than 300 units to serve the streets of the city. As environmental friendliness and sustainable growth are not included in any KPI for any Russian bureaucrat, trolley buses are nothing but a big problem for the most of them. For example, having trolley buses on the street requires transport officials to maintain its paving quality up to high standards, as trolley collectors are sensitive to shaking. Depots and power stations occupy precious land in the downtown, and there are a lot of business opportunities to just sell this land, as trolley buses can easily be replaced with cheaper diesel buses and most people won't even notice. This inevitable fate befell lots of trolley bus systems in modern Russia, even in Moscow, which not so long ago had the biggest trolley bus system in the world of more than 1,300 kilometers, and by September 2012 will have zero. Novosibirsk, on the other hand, has not lost not a single trolley bus stop, and that is another miracle of the capital of Siberia. We have reached the end of our journey. I want to thank you all for joining me. We have left all about the wild market of buses which is a whole other world shared by hundreds of private companies, decorating their machines each their own way, from some interesting 90th high-tech to disgusting raiding garbage of design. Local bus fans have a great opportunity to document all this wildlife diversity. We, however, will restrict ourselves to rail transport. So, in Novosibirsk you can write number 5, number 5 restyled, number 8, number 19, Leningrad, Belarus, Tatra K84, two types of metro trains and three types of suburban trains. That gives us 12 types of railway transport units that are significantly different on the exterior, and that gives Novosibirsk 12 points and first place in my rating of railway transport diversity of the cities of the world. We will continue our exploration of the different public transport systems. Please subscribe if you have not done so yet, and we will meet again soon. Bye!